Oh, all right. Jeff, yeah, we're, we're on air. air. We're on air. Yeah. Are we already streaming? We are now. Yes. Um, so, okay. Lucas, you want to introduce what you're doing, I guess, for help? Oh, what I'm doing? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm Lucas. I'm a researcher here at Menta, working on the machine learning team. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think it was more like, what are you about to talk about? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't know. <laughs> All right, so the whole idea is uh, I was two weeks out in this deep learning reinforcement learning summer school. Uh, it was a very good experience. Uh, a lot of the researchers in the field have gone through that summer school at some point. It's a summer school which has existed for like a long time, maybe 30 years or something. Oh, then I, if it's the same extension of the, probably this extension of the same one I went to in 88 or something. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. But they, <laughs> so, so but they so couldn't have called it then because they didn't have the term. No, it was, it was called the Connectionist Summer School. Yeah, that, that, uh, it's the same uh, summer school. It was, it was, summer school. School. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was a fantastic experience for me. Yeah. 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 But it, it, it's a lot bigger now. They said in the beginning they only had like 30 people. Yeah. And now they had 300 people out of like 5,000 applicants. Yeah. So yeah. It's, wow. it's a lot bigger, the Summer School. Wow. Hard yeah. to get into. So uh, just a oh, okay. Just short disclaimer. It's mainly because we're, it's gonna go on the web. This is just random notes. It doesn't do any justice to the lectures. It's not an access to review. I just focus on some areas uh, that are of interest for our research here, and I tailor the presentation to fit the time I have. It's just like one hour, one and a half, and I expect it out it. So I don't think you guys wanna know the details of some stuff which is not relevant. For us, so. So that's uh, the public. We had 300 attendees <laughs> from over 50 <laughs> countries. Uh, we had researchers from other fields as well, a lot of neuroscientists, some people from biology, from physics, etc. cetera. And your show is very tall. <coughs> yeah, he's, yeah. That's, or I'm very short. Uh, actually, I'm short and I look tall in this picture. <laughs> we just be. And we had like from undergrad to professors, and we even had like a girl who just came out of high school and published a paper with Joshua, so we had like a whole spectrum. And the main organizers were uh, Joshua and Rich Sutton, who is here. I beat him a beer at the bar, we talk about token people, that was fun. Um, yeah, so I Looks think- like having a good time down there. <laughs> yeah, so I think I'm here, maybe that's me, I'm not sure. <laughs> So we had four classes per day, from nine to five, Monday to Saturday. We have evening events almost every day, so it was really tiring, actually. Uh, but it was good, so it was a lot about networking, a lot about classes, but a lot about networking as well. So this was like every evening. We had this uh, kind of different mixers, and it was organized by CIFAR, so it's the same summer school that's going on for uh, 30 years. Ami, Mila, and Vector. These are institutes at Alberta, Montreal, and Toronto. And they're organized by uh, Amy is Richard Searle, Mila is Joshua Banjo, and Vector is Geoff Hinton. So it's very much a Canadian thing now. That's what it looks like. Uh, it back then it was at CMU, it was not a Canadian thing at all. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is kind of a Canadian thing now. Uh, <laughs> it sort of looked like it. Yeah. <laughs> but the, 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 the speakers were not all Canadian. Yeah. They, they even a lot of them came from Europe as well. But it's mainly organized by, by Canada. And I was really impressed by the size of these institutes, like especially Mila. Mila is like huge. It has, I think, about 500 people, including students, professors, and all. And they're affiliated to four universities in Montreal. And basically all students incoming, uh, which are studying machine learning at these universities, they go through Mila selection process before. And, and Mila, Mila is kind of sitting on top of the universities there in Montreal right now, so especially in this machine learning field. So uh, they are quite big. And I think Joshua has this goal that Montreal is Silicon Valley in 10 or 15 years. And uh, he's working hard for it. So I was really impressed by Bila. Um, yeah, uh, <coughs> about the mixers, uh, what I found very interesting is that uh, it seemed to me that we might be in a bubble <laughs> just because might be what? Like in a, in a bubble. Uh -huh. There's so many people hiring. There's like really, in the career mix, there's like. Oh, you mean like a, a, a bubble, a technology bubble? Yeah, there are like dozens of companies hiring. Yeah. And it was interesting that like most of these people, they were not looking for jobs. Like most of them were very happy into their PhDs or professorships or something. 
but all these companies they wanted to hire. And, but no one was interested, like everyone was just focused on like, <laughs> researchers are like hardcore researchers who spend their summer going over like tons of slides of math. Uh, and they were not interested in going to work for a company. So the mixers there. were sponsored by companies? So they were spo the whole event was sponsored by like a bunch of companies. Uh -huh. like, uh -huh. Even the Keter was sponsored for, for LG, for example. And they were all trying to hire, but no one was interested in working in the industry. Everyone was just <laughs> interested in doing research. So you had like this mismatch, wow. which was kind of weird. So the only company that drew everyone's attention was like DeepMind, and mainly because DeepMind works with research. And that was like an opportunity to uh, continue working with research, but in the industry. And I think that's why the mental speech was also a bit appealing for a lot of people, because uh, appealing like okay. people actually like the idea of working at Nomenta we might get a few emails I hope we already got like two emails you said uh, Nomenta speech or no uh, pitch P pitch should yeah. we pitch something yeah I pitch? pitch like a lot oh, okay. <laughs> personally you were the you were the pitch and the pitch person yeah we didn't have a stand but I pitched Nomenta okay, a lot. Right. you would go to all these mixers sponsored by other companies yeah and pitch Nomenta yeah <laughs> that was the whole I idea mean, we, didn't, we, we didn't have any formal we those. had no formal presence there just you right yeah, yeah. just me yeah. okay but so were there other firms in the private sector who have research arms that were not of interest, like Facebook research, uh, Facebook AI, right? Were so that, that's right? interesting. No, like Facebook AI and Microsoft, which yeah. are like big ones, were not there. Bosch, just the only one which was pure research focused was uh, DeepMind. All the other companies, were like small startups, they're trying to solve a problem in the industry. I see. But most people didn't care. No, they didn't work for a credit card. I don't know, risk minimization yeah. or something like that. They only care about hardcore research. Too applied. Yeah. yeah, it's too applied. <laughs> So well, it's interesting you talk about a bubble because because of that mismatch, some of these companies may figure out like that wasn't necessarily a good use of their money, and so they may they may not fund it again. And yeah, then, that's exactly it. I mean, so all of a sudden, the, the, you know, who's going to pay for it, right? I, I don't think they got anything from it, and, and maybe <laughs> they they're looking for machine learning research, but maybe that's not what they want. They just want to apply machine learning, and I think mm. they would have better luck just getting someone smart from the industry and train them on machine learning or mm. just using tools rather than trying to hire someone who's just interested in getting a paper published in the weeks next year. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so I think the interests are not aligned. And that was really clear for me at yeah. this conference. So you have that was also completely different in 88. There was no co corporate sponsorship. No one wanted to hire. It was all funded by grants, but they, everything was paid for, for everyone, uh, yeah. even back then. Did you, have to, did you have to pay to attend this one? So uh, I, I did pay now, but I actually got full funding. But I applied as a student from Brazil, then they gave me full funding. Since I'm not a student anymore, uh, I didn't accept the funding because my condition changed. So I, I paid for a part of it, and then Menta is paying for another part of it. So no. uh, I paid for subscription and everything, and Menta paid uh, for a travel ticket. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, they had a, like a lot of money. It was really well organized, and to pay for all these might be expensive. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, another thing about Menta speech is that a lot of people didn't know the Menta, and I was explaining what we do, etc. But when I got to Jeff Hawkins, they oh wow, it's Jeff Hawkins' company. So when I got tired of explaining you, I would just say, no, I work for Jeff Hawkins. Oh. <laughs> it's a shortcut. That's you know? weird. It's, it's odd that they, uh, they wouldn't know that. Yeah, yeah I, I think a lot of people like read the book, but probably they didn't follow up yeah, you know, and, yeah, and found yeah. out about the mental. You know, it's, you know, it's interesting because um, you know, the book really did reach a lot of people. So um, you know, that's why I'm writing another one. I think it's a good, it's a good tool for reaching people. Reach me. There you go. Yeah, I mean, if you can reach like all of us here. Yeah, I know. It's, it's interesting how that is in some, you can, you can think of it as like a, a marketing pitch in some sense, but it was, it's not written for that, but it does have that effect. Yeah, it is. So the summer school was actually two summer schools, and up until last year, it was separate. Uh, they had separate application process and all, and now it's just a joint one. So we had deep learning for four days, and then important learning for five days. So in deep learning, day one, uh, we started with Yugo, who just gave like an introduction to neural networks. Uh, and just a, a comment, these are mainly my notes. I transcribed to the slides. When I wrote them, most of them make sense. But now, like two weeks later, without any context, a lot of them don't make any sense. <laughs> but I did transcribe anyway. So I might not be able to answer a few questions, but I can uh, write down and come back later with answers. And you said these, are, these talks are eventually going to be online. 
these stocks are eventually going to be online. One uh, bad thing that a lot of people complain is that they didn't release the slides, mm -hmm. even, uh, not even before or after. Uh, usually what I like to do when I go to these uh, things is that I look at the slides before, so I don't have that effect of every slide is a surprise thing. So I know what's coming and I can prepare for it. But since they didn't release, we had this, you know, like, you went to this presentation, every slide was like this whole new thing, and you didn't have time like, to Google and learn that thing at the time. And they didn't even release the slides after, just a few presentations. So I couldn't like see my notes and go through the slides and kind of remember. So a lot of the things I wrote up, I was trying to understand what is it, and I couldn't find the answer. So, so my, uh, I'm expecting for the videos to come out, so i am probably do the summer school again at my home. <laughs> that's the that's plan. So Hugo gave an introduction to neural networks. That was a really good class. Uh, he has uh, this, his videos online. He's uh, working at Google AI right now. Um, didn't have like any... He talked about over-parameterization as an approach to escape of saddle points and that we might have a winning ticket in the neural networks. So that's exactly the problem we are working on. What does that mean, a winning ticket? Okay. A winning ticket is that there is an optimal set of parameters, which is uh, smaller than uh, the full dense network, yeah. which has a better performance than the full network. That you don't need all the parameters, you only need a small set of them, but you have to find which parameters are. So how does over-parameterization, that sounds like over-parameterization is a benefit. Well, it's a benefit because when you start a network, it's like you have all these tickets, and uh -huh. one of them is going to be uh, a winning one. So that's a, that's a way of uh, scaping saddle points. So yeah. it, it is a benefit, but you have a different way of scaping saddle points. Maybe you don't need the over parameter yeah. And that's kind of the problem we, we also have been working on here. And at, later we had Graham Taylor from Vector to talk about CNNs, was also an introdu introductory talk. Uh, he talked a little bit about state-of-the-art networks, which are squeeze and excitation networks. That's actually the first time I heard about and the only difference on that is that you have this new layer with weights each channel adaptively. So not all channels have the same weight when creating the output feature map. That's how uh, CNNs work. And I thought it relates a lot to attention. Because you basically assign different weights to different filters. And attention does that, but in a temporal, uh, in a temporal dimension. So you have shared words that are convolving across an image, just like a standard CNN, but yes. then different channels have their own. Have different features. weights, yeah. So you, you can uh, attribute like more relevance to one specific channel compared to another. So this is done dynamically? This is done dynamic. This is learned, yeah. So that's the, the main difference. That's from a 2017 work. And I think it's the latest winner of the ImageNet. I'm almost sure. The frontier on CNNs is extending to non-included data. A lot of people talk about that, and that includes uh, graph convolutional neural networks or uh, neural networks that work on uh, spherical data or any kind of uh, non including data. And wh what is the motivation for that? I mean, is, are there problems like that, or is it just more of a pure... Uh, no, no, there, there, there are problems like that. One of them is graph, so how do you learn over graphs. Yeah. And, uh, but but what does that translate into the real world? I mean, I understand what... The well, for example, ideas, social networks who have all this uh, graph data. All right, so the assumption that there, there is, there, the data actually may be in some non Lucidian space, and yeah. how do we, but we may not even know what that space looks like, right? So, yeah. so, so the idea is that it figures that out or something. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, okay. And he also, one thing interesting he mentioned is that batch norm affects robustness, and uh, he showed like a few slides. Uh, showing that, and that fix up may be a solution. So fix up is just a better way to initialize the network uh, so that the network is stable without requiring batch norm. So fix up is also recent work, I think 2016. Not a lot of people have been using, but uh, as he presented, it seems that it works fine and it may be a good replacement for batch norm. So we can, we can try. Uh, in the afternoon we had this discussion with four members, it was really <laughs> interesting. I couldn't get the name of two of the people. I tried to look everywhere, I couldn't find it. I just put like philosophy professor and law professor. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, good enough, they're all the same. <laughs> I, I really tried, I mean. <laughs> there wasn't like a schedule that had a list of, list of speakers? It was not, because this was a, a cross panel. So these people were coming from, there was a summer institute on AI and society happening. Uh, and they just like relocated in the afternoon and I don't think it was planned or not. It was really interesting, but 
it was not in this, their names were not in this gallery, but I really look for it. So we had Richard Searle, he was talking about moving beyond humanism and how we should look to a diverse society in the near future where we have humans, hybrids, and artificial agents which can coexist. That's an interesting point of view. Uh, we had this philosopher uh, professor who was, I really like his talk, I wish I'd find his name. He was talking about AI researchers being uh, world builders and he discussed the paperclip analogy, where I found it very interesting. That's a uh, Nick Bostrom analogy that he says if you optimize an AI with a single objective of creating paperclips, it's just gonna convert the whole world into a paperclip. And he said that's silly to think like that because the organizations we have today are exactly that. They're like single objective, multi-massive uh, algorithms or they are tailored to do one thing, and that's like every startup dream is, you know, like to convert the whole world into its objective. And so you are already have that scenario, and what stops them from doing that is that we have several startups trying to uh, maximize their single objective, so they compete in this space, and that's probably going to happen in AI as well. So you might have like one AI with single objective, but you're going to have many AIs, and they're going to compete to make words into it. One's making paper clips and others making brass tacks. Yeah. <laughs> so, so as long as the super intelligent explosion happens in parallel among many super intelligent <laughs> AIs, yeah. we'll be safe. Of <laughs> that, that's kind of the thing, you know. As long as they're like Google, so, Facebook, so and Microsoft, there. not just Google, you're safe. So that's, that was his point. At least I can sleep easy now. <laughs> <laughs> so there, uh, a law professor was focused on a lot of ethics. Uh, she was talking about that every decision we do comes with an implication, and they're working on defining like an ethical score for machine learning projects. Uh, she also talked a lot about how machine learning researchers should worry about what they are doing, uh, their ethical implications in every small decision. Uh, even small decisions like you just make a network which is 10 times bigger and performs better, then you're suddenly consuming 10 times more energy. That's an ethical decision you make. Or you can insert a lot of kind of bias into your products and that shouldn't be that should be the concern of every machine learning researcher, and you shouldn't just say, oh, my boss asked me to do it, so she was really <laughs> emphasizing that point. <laughs> we had uh, Dirk Hovey, he's a natural language processing researcher. Uh, he also talked about that, so that every tag conceived has a, has a possible tool use, and developers should take into account. So when they're making something, they should think of all the other ways that people are using that, and if there are any bad ways. And he also talked about privacy, and that on the early industrial revolution, we had many uh, social issues, and they seem at the time inevitable, but we kind of fix them, and we don't have kids working in factories 12 hours per day. And he thinks privacy is at the same early stage. It seems inevitable that uh, privacy is going to be gone, but we might fix it, and society's going to fight back, and it might fix privacy in the near future. So that's an optimistic view, I would say. And the only general consensus I find is that that consideration should be made by every developer. I think that's, and some would argument that they should be done earlier at the funding stage. That's the responsibility of people who are funding AI. Everyone should read Ted Chiang. And everyone should read Ted Chiang. I don't know who's Ted yeah, Chiang. I think this is the author by, uh, behind um, the Arrival movie. I think there was, a, there was a short story written, I think, by oh, Ted Chiang. Yeah. What does that mean? He's like a science fiction writer? He's a yes. science fiction yes. writer. Oh, really? Yes. Apparently, everyone loves him. I don't know his book, so I can't. <laughs> I, I, find, I find it annoying. Uh, Go ahead. I, was just, yeah, I think he's compared to uh, Liu Shixin, the, the um, Chinese pop author Liu behind the Body Problem, yeah. Ah. which was amazing. I mean, it's so, funny yeah. that. Uh, yeah, I, I, so when someone says, oh, you really should read somebody, and I say, yeah, I probably should. But then when you say there's science fiction, I'm like, what? Yeah, that, that, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like he poses the problems in a like realistic manner. I don't know. Uh, he's thinking about the future in a way that can actually happen, so it's a good reflection. That's kind of the point. But I, I never read, so. Ted? Ted Chan. Yeah. So everyone... <laughs> All, all four of these speakers agreed. Yeah, that. like three or four of them, yeah. I mean, except for the law professor, the other ones all talk about that Chang, so I was paying. That's not his real name. It's not his real name? No, his real name is Chang Fen, Feng Nan. Oh, he adopted like a Western name. Uh, but he didn't, it's not quite a Western name. Maybe he called himself Ted Adams or something. Well. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, sorry. No, so in the second day, we had uh, Angel Chang from NAMI on uh, SFU. 
But can I just a question? Was that yeah. the only time sort of these ethic issues and philosophical issues were really talked a lot at the conferences? Or did they come a lot in the other discussions or in the social? No, that that. Yeah, I think that was it. That was it. That there was, was it. Wasn't there a talk by uh, Benji that was talking about? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a presentation by Joshua, and he talked a lot about it. So Joshua Benjo is uh, later or in a different day or in a different day. Yeah. So it was a specific. This was like a panel. Yeah. There was a specific presentation by Joshua Benjo, and he talked a lot about that as well. So that was not the only time. But not all all other researchers didn't talk a lot about this. So there was no presentation on uh, fairness and bias, for example, which uh, like come or federated learning, which are yeah. some machine learning fields which are concerned with. Uh, with privacy. privacy or social Security, organization. Yeah. So there were no talks about that. So I think yeah. it was kind of limited in that sense. Okay. So the, the talks range from some were like very introductory, some were very advanced focused on state of the art. I've been to other summer schools and in other summer school, you're either trying to teach like one semester graduate course in one week, and then it's just that one thing and you end up learning that thing. Or you're just covering a lot of advanced topics and works more like a conference. This one was kind of a mix. They kind of trying to convey two or three years of graduate course in two weeks. So it's, it was not the kind of summer school you go <laughs> learn and you go home and do it. It's more the kind of summer school that people try to attend every year to get you know, like some more exposure to what's going on in the field. So this one, I think, was a mixed talk. So by Angel Chang was really interesting. She talked about state of the art being instant segmentation. And I think some, my slides are okay, but they're not showing, hmm. uh, they're like- What's the bottom thing say? Yeah, the bottom thing is like covered. No um, spatial extent, no objects. Yeah, so th these are the difference between, so this is regular classification, telling if it's a cat or not a cat. This is semantic segmentation, that's basically pixel classification. So you're seeing all these are grass, all these are cat. This is uh, object detection when you have like multiple objects in the image. So semantic segmentation can do that. If you have like two cat, you're just gonna like mix up the pixels. And well, the state of the art now is doing instant segmentation that you, you can capture like there are several cats in the image and you can get their perfect boundaries. So you can use that for example to eliminate someone from an image. And, and that's like 2017 state of the art. So the systems you have today are very advanced and you can actually like, I can take a picture of this room, I can remove three people, nobody will know the difference. I just put the background image. Uh, it's kind of scary. <laughs> so we evolved, we had uh, RCNN and then we evolved fast RCNN, fast RCNN, and now we have mask RCNN. And it just keeps getting faster and faster. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work now in multimodal learning and basically both reasoning and word knowledge. So this is a clever data set. And the clever data set involves, you have this question, and you have to answer a question based on the image. So the question, for example, is, are there an equal number of large things in metaspheres? And that, that's an easy problem for a human being, but that's a really hard problem for a machine. It looks just like uh, Bloch's world. Yes, <laughs> it looks a lot like Bloch's world. Yeah, and I, and basically, I think that's, that's inspiration for it. And there is also this uh, GQA data set, which is the same as Clever, but with everyday image. So it's more, you can reason on top of uh, actual reality. Um, Angel talk about non-included uh, data and graph CNNs as well. She talk a lot about 3D images, and there are four ways of doing it. One is uh, using surface, like triangle mesh, which is using games. There is a multi-view, and you have like a set of images, the camera goes around and takes a lot of pictures. There is a volumetric data, which is just voxels. It's a 4D tensor. It's pixels, but with added channels. And there is point cloud. Uh, most of the 3D data is in the form of point cloud. It's just bag of points. But the issue with bag of points is order invariant, and there is no locality. And so you have some models which work on that. Some newer models are working mainly on, on voxels. You have techniques to convert a point cloud to a voxel. You like upsend your point cloud to a voxel. So voxel yeah, that's a voxel wide, yeah. That would be the, the word. Um, and she, she showed like recent work on scene synthesis. And scene synthesis is like to create a scene. And for example, you can build a room. And you can train this by getting several rooms. And you mask a few objects. And you train the network to build 
that object which is gone. So you can show different rooms and you can mask the bad and you can train the network to figure out where the bad's gonna be. And then you can use that network to generate like new rooms. So you have like a new space and you want to generate, uh, you want to see where the pointers are gonna go and you can use the network to do that. So this is actually from a real world application, this example here. Uh, you got Joshua talk on uh, RNNs. That was slightly more advanced, a lot more advanced than the previous one. <laughs> um, I think I mainly highlight. I think the main points here are like a lot of notes to go through. Uh, what I think it's what's different for me here is um, using attention for memory access, where to write, deciding where to write and where to read, in like a large memory. And you can derive large memory networks from that, where you have sparse access memory for long-term dependencies. And the whole idea is that you can connect, you can have a memory for a network which is not limited to a, a small, small space. If you have a, a way of knowing where you save that specific memory you need. So it's like you're using attention to look to know where in the memory you want to look for the data you want. So you can have like this large memory associated with small networks. So like neural Turing machines, do they have a similar like memory access? I'm, I'm not familiar with yeah. neural Turing machines. That's a model? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not familiar, maybe. maybe. That's from Yoshua's side? I'm not sure. I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar. This looks like a large collection of stuff. Is it, is it in some sense, are these all integrated or are these dif different approaches that people are taking? And, uh, all this, uh, like notes. Yeah. These are all like small, slightly different approaches. So it's not like these are aspects of one big research effort. These are like little pieces of people trying this, people trying that. Yeah, so most of most of this talk they try to cover the state of the art. So we talk like about a lot of slightly different models from different yeah. groups mm -hmm. trying to solve <coughs> the same problem. Uh, these large memory networks are specifically from Yasha's group, so so I'm focused on it. I have like a lot of attention related stuff. There is a lot of attention related stuff. Yeah. What does it mean, a large memory network? I don't know, I don't know what that So the, 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 that's the whole idea. You have a small network, and you can have a large memory attached to it. And the way you... The memory just is remembering what? It, you can memorize, for example, uh, past states, or you can memorize... Um, for example, if, you want, if you're trying to learn long-term dependence, yeah. then you need to keep... Uh, you need to... Keep a record of what Keep happened record before. Record of what happened in the past. So, so they're doing it in a separate memory bank someplace. Yeah. So and then you can train like an attention model to decide where to save and where to retrieve uh, that data mm -hmm. from. So essentially, you could, for example, access something that happened a million time steps in the past. Mm -hmm. If you know you're looking for a specific time step, mm -hmm. which is a million uh, time steps in the past. So that was. That is the meaning. It's a, a new idea for neural networks, I think. I, I haven't heard of that before. Yeah, that's, that's like state-of-the-art stuff. If you didn't even need for a paper, I think that's like ongoing research. I mean, it's a little bit like, um, well, I'm thinking how this is done in the brain, and there's, there's multiple ways of doing it in the brain. But anyway, so it's a new direction for them. Yeah. Uh, Yasha was one of the few researchers which were concerned with uh, brain, how the brain works versus machine learning. So a lot of the things he talks about, he also makes analogies with, with the brain. Um, oh, that's, this is actually quite interesting. He was talking about the consciousness prior, and it, is, it comes up in another talk as well. What does that mean, the consciousness prior? So it, it's this idea that you have a high dimension abstract representation space, which you have like a, it's a very high dimension, and you know just concepts and factors, and you reason based on that. And that's going to direct your attention towards low dimensional uh, it's other. Right? So you have low dimensional So this high dimensional thing is quote consciousness, is that the idea? Oh, it's, sorry, it's the other way around. So you have this low dimensional conscious spot. So you can represent things in low dimensional. And you can reason faster in low dimensional things. And then when you need to attend to something high dimensional, you just attend to that specific thing you want. So you can, uh, like, just to generalize, like we can reason about the room thinking about chairs, table, and people. And then if we need the specifics of the table, then we can ac access a higher dimensional representation of the table. Mm -hmm. For example, if you, I want to depend on the table, mm -hmm. then 
it's not enough to know it's a table. I need to know that that's the specifics of mm -hmm. the table. Mm -hmm. And I would access that specific high dimension of representation. Mm -hmm. Essentially, he uses the word conscious for that. Uh, Meaning the high, uh, the, the low dimensional space. For the top of the hierarchy. Yeah. 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 So here is the, the conscious state, it's the low dimensional, and you can reason in it. And then, yeah. Is he defining a form of projection of some sort, or what? From the low to the high dimensional space? Or either way. Yeah. You, you need at least a mapping, right? Uh, that tells you that this representation is the same as that representation. So that that's got done by this tension mechanism. So this guy decides where when you need to go down in details. So when you need to go down in details, then you access the high dimension. Yeah. It's interesting, I, you know, I've never, it's the first time I've seen a neural network researcher use that term conscious or conscious state or something like that. Yeah, that that's, a, that's his paper, actually. He's on the yeah, well, I mean, I just, I just wrote this chapter on consciousness, right? And yeah. so I've been reading what all these philosophers and other people have said yeah. about consciousness. And this is yet, a, it's related, but a very different idea. And so it's just one more way to confuse people, I think. Um, <laughs> The parallel of attention, right? Attention, <laughs> attention was brought into the field, and machine yeah. learning researchers redefined what attention meant. Yeah, and and now and that and going and the now they're just using the term, but I think many people would disagree with that use of the term. So I'm not putting a judgment value on it. It's just interesting that someone has decided to use that term, which is a very controversial term and you know arguable about what it means. And now Yashio is just sort of absorbing it into machine learning. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I think people are going to use that term a lot more. There seems to be work done on top of these ideas, so mm. we, I think we're going to hear a lot more the term consciousness. The maybe. philosophers are going to be unhappy about Yeah, it. <laughs> it's like attention, it's going to be converted yeah. or like something yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in some sense, it, doing that without being upfront stating that you're doing it is somewhat of a disservice. It, can, it just makes more confusion for people. So we had Greg Mori from Borealis talking about video. What's that company? I didn't know that. Borealis is the AI arm of RBC. RBC is the uh, Royal Bank of Canada. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And they have this AI arm, it's called uh, Borealis. And they have like a very big machine learning team. I'm always scared when banks have big machine learning teams. <laughs> 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 That's OK. They seem to do, be doing like good research. Uh, so he talked about state of the art being activity recognition, activity detection. So you only, you recognize activity, you also localize in space and time, so you know when the activity starts, when it finishes, and where it's happening. And uh, that's what you want in video, like there is an example here. So you, you know all these people <coughs> there, what they're doing, what they're about to do, and you can also have like a time frame when they started, when they ended. Uh, there is this issue of early recognition. So you want to infer the next section, so you're trying to recognize activity in the video as early as possible. So for example, if you want to stop someone from shooting people like in public, you want to recognize the activity even before it takes place. So when somebody is reaching for the gun and then it's they're- a terrifying application then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it's a bank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have, there are several ways of doing that. Uh, most popular ways is classifying voxels, I would say, that's the state of the art. So you have these two proposal networks. It's so instant segmentation that we saw here, but in a 4D scenario, so that's why it's like a tube. Uh, you also have this uh, idea of group activity recognition, that you want to identify what a group's going to do in the video, like where, where people are moving, who is going to interact with who. And there's new ideas here, for example, social pooling, where you do LSTM of spatially proximal sequence um, Proximal sequence share their hidden states. So, like, the whole idea is that you can share knowledge between uh, LSTMs of things that are happening closer in the video. Yeah, LSTM for each region of a video, and then nearby regions share. Yeah, it would be like an LSTM for each person in a group. So, yeah. like, we have like a thousand persons in a video, and then they would share their hidden state. That would be the social pooling. Huh. Uh, and he talked about generative models of video which are still in the early stage, but it's likely the most groundbreaking application of machine learning that's gonna come in the few years. We already have like some examples which are a bit scary of videos being generated. I think when we have very good, maybe it will even like change the movie industry or I don't know what yeah, you don't have to. You, you don't have to actually have actors act anymore. Yeah, you they don't. just license their, their, their previous face. work 
and then uh, and then they create new movies that are using you. That's so th there are a lot of work like trying to create videos from scripts. Even yeah. uh, actually, Angel Chang talk about him, but she's working on this problem that you have this script and you try to create like a movie or video out of this script. Yeah. It's, uh, it's it's an early stage, but there is a way towards it, so it might be happening. Uh, the, the issue with generative models, it requires temporal consistency. Mm -hmm. So the issue with generating images is that it requires spatial consistency. So you can't like generate something, a chair which has like the back of the chair that's in the bottom. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. And But when you go to videos, now you need temporal consistency, which is a whole new issue. So it's not that easy. Uh, so you need to find ways of uh, keeping high level control of the content you, you generate so you can avoid these kind of issues. And current models are using uh, operational encoders with LSTMs. Um, and they're trying to find a way of inserting priors uh, and, and incorporating physical, physical relations between objects so you don't break the law of physics in your video, which is uh, really important if you're trying to generate a realistic video. But most movies these days, they, they don't care. Yeah, <laughs> if it's an animation <laughs> or anything. Or just movie. anything, you know, some, some fight scene, you know, like yeah. jumps 50 feet in the air, whatever. Maybe a romance of burning the illusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember it was in India about some Bollywood movies. A lot of them like didn't make didn't make sense. Like at some point thing didn't make sense. Animation as well, so not that important maybe. So on day three we had uh, Jimmy Ba from Vector talking about optimization. Uh, he started the talk saying that Newton's method performs well and why shouldn't you use Newton's method? And that, that's I think it's a big question in the community. What is Newton's method? That's an uh, optimization approach to try to find the roots of the function through an iterative method. Uh, I don't know exactly the details of the method, but it's a different optimization method than uh, gradient descent. Is that named after so, yeah, the second derivative? Yeah. Uh, go straight to the. I see. That that right. over Okay. But you you can take like steps towards it, right? You look at the second derivative, take steps towards it. And he said the reason we don't use it is because it's computationally expensive and because of the behavior of the algorithm locally in each region of the space. But there might be ways of moving from gradient descent into Newton's method. So a lot of people are looking into that. Uh, the information per here, per here, here is uh, variance. And one thing a lot of people talk about is that a huge assumption of neural networks is it's IID. <laughs> and Super die. <laughs> You've been talking yeah, about, about this. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, what about non IAD data? And one example is active learning. So, you pick the points you want to learn from, uh, which makes convergence a lot faster, but then you lose the IAD uh, assumption. Can you define IAD? Uh, it's independently identically. identically distributed data. So, that they are sampled independently from the same distribution. And that's not like real life. The distribution shifts, oh. for example, then it's not. I it's sort of the, the order in which things appear is assumed to be random. Yeah. 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 Okay. The, the, so the what happened just previously? Translate what happened previously shouldn't affect what's happening now. Yeah. Which, right. Which not is realistic. Of course, and it's completely opposite. What goes on in the brain? The distribution doesn't change. Right. So yeah, that, there are two parts of that, right? You pick random, and the distribution doesn't change. And those two things, like in real life, you can't assume. None of that. <laughs> but RNNs don't make these assumptions, right? Uh, I'm not sure. They're, they're updating a hidden state, and so they're updating distributions based on recent history. Yeah, I no. think this is true for typical feedforward networks, but I'm not sure it's true for RNNs. Yeah, even reinforcement learning. But the thing about reinforcement learning is that you break this assumption because you're navigating the environment, so it's not uh, IAD, yeah. but you're still using the learning. Which, so the optimization method has this assumption. doesn't mean your problem has this assumption. So that's the issue of the optimization method and why we're looking at new ways of optimizing. And maybe there's like a better way of doing RNNs since RNNs are non IAD. You know. On the afternoon, we had a lot of fish talking on an NP. Uh, it was mainly introductory, that's why I don't have like a lot of notes. Not, not anything like new. Yeah. So this is my name. I talk, should talk about negative sampling, which is basically required because the denominator of softmax is huge, so you're trying to figure out... Uh, what is negative sampling? What does that mean? Negative sampling is, for example, when you, you're doing word embedding, yeah. so you want to predict the probability of a given word in that context. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but when you're doing softmax, you have to divide by the probability of all possible words. So if you do like the true softmax distribution, you have to consider all possible words, which is like huge. Mm -hmm. So instead, you just pick a few negative samples. So you have a positive sample, which the words appear in that context, mm -hmm. and you add like a few randomly chosen, randomly chosen negative samples just to calculate your softmax. Should you talk about hierarchical softmax at all? Uh, no. Is this something that I came across recently? But no, I should do that. I'm actually interested in <laughs> You can talk about it. And never heard about the denominator based on the context. Oh. Um, okay. And on the same day, this was a hard day. <laughs> it was like half of the day was math. So we had uh, math. math, yeah. Because yeah, <laughs> we're talking about uh, optimization. Yeah. And then we had Bayesian deep learning with uh, Roger Gross from Vector. It was a really good talk. So the difference between Bayesian and regular deep learning is that instead of doing point estimation, you are learning the distribution. So you, you assume in all of the Gaussian and you're learning a mean and standard deviation. So I think this picture kind of represents. So this is the point estimate and this is the this, sorry, distribution you're learning. So this is another way of seeing it. So these pictures are just from the internet. Since I didn't have access to the slides, they're not really from the slides, just filled. Uh, one of the issues in traditional deep learning is the calibration problem, that softmax always push the probabilities uh, to be very low or very high, and you end up having uh, probabilities which are not calibrated to the reality, and you can kind of fix that use temperature scaling. But there are other ways of fixing it. If you're doing Bayesian deep learning, you kind of get the probability, the right probabilities right away, because you're modeling uncertainty as well. You're not modeling as point estimations. Um, right. So it's, a, it's an interesting application for exploration as well, since they are naturally stochastic, you're modeling uncertainty. So it's, yeah, but the good thing about it is that when you get to a result, you also know how certain, how uncertain you are on that result. So that's a good point of Bayesian deep learning. But I think there's a lot of research on it recently, and maybe we'll be seeing a lot more on that. We want to speed up a little bit. I was going to say. 11 o'clock now. It's already 11? Yeah. yeah. Really I, I didn't wait to make slide. I okay, I'll speed one up. Two things from each one. Okay, yeah. sorry. So we get autoencoders in the afternoon. Um, so autoencoders, maybe I'll just explain the pictures. So it's basically this idea of compressing data into a, a latent representation which serves as a bottleneck. And this latent representation, it's uh, of smaller size than the original idea, and then you can compress an image and recreate. So an internet application, for example, is you want to send images to your phone, and then you can send in the latent space and then reconstruct them in your phone. So you have uh, a lower uh, bandwidth uh, it's required to send that image. So autoencoders are used like everywhere. Uh, okay. About autoencoders. Uh, what's interesting here is that you have this new applications of autoencoders like Glow, which can generate images very similar to GANs. So I think GANs right now are the state of the art for generative models, but autoencoders are, are, are closing that gap. They're getting very close to GANs. And that's basically uh, unsupervised. Um, the difference with GANs is that GANs you have this other, you have these two networks which are doing, one is trying to get generate better image, the other is trying to classify, but you, have, you still need like a little bit of supervised uh, labels, and autoencoders you don't need at all. It's fully unsupervised. So, talking about GANs. <laughs> So yeah, are GANs supervised? I don't think you need to label the data, right? No, but a little bit, yeah, because you, you need some ground truth. Uh, you, need, you need to differentiate between some image which is like real and some image which is fake. No, the discriminator learns that. Yeah, the discriminator learns that, but in order to learn, you have to learn. You, you need some real, like small real data. You, you generate some data oh, which yeah. you know is fake, but you also need the positive label. The real data is, I mean, the autocoder has real data also. Yeah, yeah but yeah. It, it doesn't need the labels. But you never need to give it the gen the gen the can that goes back to that. Like it learns the oh I guess, oh yeah I guess that's true oh I see what you're saying you need to tell the can like oh these are real these are real and these are fake. Yeah, I guess, okay. Well, it seems like the information source is still the same, though. You just have a bunch of real images, and you know that they're real in both yeah. cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, uh, like, looking back, maybe <laughs> I made the wrong assumption. The information is sure. the same, yeah. No, I think you're right. 
So talking about GAN, so this is how GAN works. I think Michael and just, just described. You get real data, you get a generated network, and then you get this discriminator network to try to classify what's uh, real or not, and they're like competing. So the generate is getting better because it's trying to fool the discriminator. And here, usually, you can use you can just insert random noise and then you generate, but you can also use priors. So you can set up your problem in a way that you can generate something which specific what you want to generate. Right? You can like mix two faces and try to you can insert style into something. And these are examples of images being generated by GANs. These are, these are not real people, these are fake people. And it's a bit scary. I think everyone saw this image. If you insert style on the generator, uh, it doesn't become trivial to do the discrimination. How do you make sure that the discriminator is still has a problem I can solve? Insert style doesn't become trivial too. You were saying that you can add a prior, like if you want to, do, for example, insert style into a GAN, so it's right. generating a style image. Doesn't that make the discrimination task much easier? Because real data doesn't have style. Uh, it doesn't. I don't know. I'm not sure. So yeah, Maybe we can talk about later. Yeah. Uh, that was interesting, and <laughs> maybe you should talk more about this. So that was Blake Richards' talk, and the talk is it's called Deep Learning in the Brain. And the whole talk was about how deep learning is feasible in the brain. So he started the talk saying, long ago I drank Jeff Hinton's Kool-Aid, that backpropagation is the way, and we're on that, and I want to show you that the brain can backpropagate. And it was very good exposure. I mean, he's uh, he's good at it, and he defined like there are three issues that why people usually say backpropagation can't work in the brain. One, you don't have an error term, and then he showed this solution of equilibrium propagation. He says the, the brain alternates between free phase, which has no external feedback, and weakly clamped phase, which uh, external environment nudges the network. And the difference between the correlations is the gradient of the error. Uh, I'm not entirely sure right now how this works. I wish I had access to this slide. But I, I do have some, a lot of pictures. So. Yeah, we did a, a review. You did a review on this paper a while ago. Okay. We could do that again. Is this okay. the oscillation thing where you have like predictions and then it's being compared to get prediction errors? Is this alternation and oscillation based alternation? That's something that's something that you've talked about in the past, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a different dynamic. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's an oscillation. Uh, I'm not sure if it's an oscillation also. I, I do have the picture of this. What's pictures. the overall reaction to this? Did you get a sense of that? Did people believe this? Is it? Yeah, she was like the pop star of the conference. Like, yeah, a lot of people, I think there was the hugest line I've seen to talk to the present speaker was uh, Blake Richards. Uh, interestingly, a few people uh, came to talk to me as well because I've been pitching the opposite in the <laughs> past few days. So when Black Preachers comes and say the brain can back propagate, and then a lot of people. I mean, you know, I mean, it, on the surface, it, for everything I know says it's, it's not true, but it could be true. But on the surface, it doesn't look like it, and it, it feels to me like, like, um, you know, if you're a believer, you try to fit all data to your beliefs, you yes. know, <laughs> and, and you can go to great extremes to do so. You come up with tremendous arguments for the existence of something. I just, you know, I, I, so I have to ask myself all the time, like, well, am I wrong about this? Is it really, really true? And, and the other point is, 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 you know, are other people buying and drinking the Kool-Aid and, and believing it? I think maybe, maybe because it's a machine learning conference, but it seems like 95% of the people drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. Well, I mean, they didn't drink the Kool-Aid like a long time ago. <laughs> and it, it's just... Like in some ways, refreshing to know that oh, the brain might be doing this as well. So that's uh, yeah. I think was very. I popular. mean, it's clear the brain, in the neocortex, is not a CNN. I mean, it's just the complexity of it is incredible compared to these things and all the different components and so on. Um, but um, but that's not clear to other people. Well, well, one thing is that he had like a lot of data showing. So he got like brain data, and then he tried to feed neural network models and he was showing like seemed like evidence that uh, that's possible in the brain like uh, 
deep learning is a good model for how what the brain is doing. So I yeah, have, like, I know, a lot I know, of but you cherry pick yeah. your data. Yeah, right. But it's like you said, you can fit anything. Yeah, if you're, you're, really if you're a believer, you can, you know, you, if you know what made the arc, you'll find all this evidence that he did it. And you can write books about it. You know, it's like, um, it doesn't make it true. And I, it's, I, I don't know, I'm just curious how this is playing out. Uh -oh. it's, a little, it's a little bothersome if everyone believes it. But, I mean, it's, it could, it's like, for example, back propagation, <coughs> could it be occurring in the brain? Sure, but would it be the essence of what's going on in the brain? Absolutely not. It could well, be one piece, but I don't think it's even that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it'd be interesting if we, if we actually go through the talk, maybe when it comes out. Yeah. Uh, it talks, I found it interesting this part of, uh, about the burst. It says an event could be a spike or burst. We also use the burst in our model. And he says the event rate can communicate bottom up signals, and the burst rate can communicate top down signals. And you can update the weights using the difference in the burst probability between time steps. So the gist of it, I got that. Is that just made up, or is it evidence that suggests anything like that? Well, he, he showed like a lot of evidence, but like it's like neuroscience, you can show evidence for. Yeah. So this might rely on stuff like um, Matthew Larkin's data, where the top-down feedback onto the apical dendrites yeah. can cause this burst to happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. Whereas if you don't have that, you often don't get any burst. Yeah. So but he's talking about here burst so that rate. Would be like communicating top burst down versus rate, maybe. The top-down yeah. signal versus the bottom. I don't know. Just so it's clear to everyone here, this isn't this isn't talking about bursting that we talk about sometimes with many columns. This is bursting like a cell fire. Yeah, yeah individually. Uh, yeah. yeah. Whether yeah. a cell yeah. has yeah. a single yeah. spike yeah. or a, yeah. a small group of spikes. Okay. So I, I interviewed him. I have a, a video of it. Too. Oh, you did? Well, it's not a video. It's just, it's just on the podcast. And we talked a little bit about apical credit assignment in that okay. interview. That, that's, that's cool. I have a... I've showed some big, but I think you can't see anything in this slide. Wait, sorry, what did you say about that prop through time? That was just the last one. Oh, yeah, he said one oh, open. one open question. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the only open question is how you do back prop through time in the brain. So when people are interested in this, um, why would they be interested in it? I mean, in theory, you don't need to, you don't need to know this if you are a believer in back prop. And, yeah, is, it, is it because they think they're going to learn something about how to build their networks? Or is it because they're looking to justify what they've already doing? I think it's I the think second it's one. one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think this feels really good if you've been doing back prop for a long time. It seems to work really well. Now you don't have to understand the brain anymore because you've learned that the brain is doing it yeah. also. Right? So that's, or, that, yeah. Uh, or slightly similar, you, you, get a, sorry, uh, you, you get a feeling that like I'm going in a good direction. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah it's but, like, but they're not saying, oh, okay, now I have to learn the neuroscience because it's going to inform me. It, they're not doing If that. he had said back prop can't happen in the brain, then they would have to actually learn the neuroscience. Yeah. But this is an easier yeah. hour. I mean, in some sense, this is a, this basic attitude existed back, even before, you know, in the old days of AI, way back when. Um, there's always been this sort of tension between neuroscience and AI. And when I, when I applied to the MIT AI lab, I mean, that's what I ran up against. This is before neural networks. This is mm -hmm. in classic AI. And, you know, and they basically said that, you know, that you don't need to study the brain, and here's why, because our algorithms already capture that. And the brain is just a messy version of those algorithms, so why should we study it? We just, you know, we're just doing the right thing. So it hasn't really changed. Um, it's an obstacle, in some sense, for our mission. Um, but it's just what it is. Oh, one thing I find interesting is that Geoff Hinton has been saying a lot that we should move away from backpropagation, but Geoff Hinton's students are very much into backpropagation. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, it, it, and he's running, so he's running into the same problem, right? You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting human condition, you know, why this is like this and, and why they're so excited about it. It's interesting. If you just called this credit assignment instead of backcrop, though, I wonder if it would be easier to, to swallow for everyone. So that uh, I, I think it's it's important to play. he does he does he does it. make that distinction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you think about literally the backcrop algorithm, Blake says that's not possible. Right, right, right. right. Okay. But if you think about it as one part of the brain trying to understand what something way several steps down yep. is doing, that's credit mm -hmm. assignment. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. what he's focused on. Everyone oh, would agree that okay. the brain has to solve that problem too. Yeah. Yeah. Does yeah. everyone understand that distinction? Um, I, I don't didn't. know, but there was. Um, I know he's been very clear on that. And, um, oh, he so made that distinction at the beginning of the talk, talking yeah. about credit assignment. But I mean, in the talk, that talk yeah, itself. Yeah, the distinction. Right? Was the backprop yeah, again? What does yeah. the word backprop, the phrase backprop, mean? 
you could take it very literally, in which case it's not what they, if you say it, you use it as a proxy for credit assignment or, you know, then. So I, I take it one level up further. I, the, the big question here is, the professor was just talking about, you know, are, are what they're doing today, what's going on in the brain, doesn't have to be, but um, the real question is, do we need to know what's going on in the brain to move forward? And that's the broad question, right. whether it's backprop or reinforcement learning or whatever you want to call it, all those other terms, you know, uh, are they, you know, do you need to know the, the brain to, to make pro to get to the ultimate solution here is really the big question. I think most of the researchers I've talked to, they, they think the answer is yes. I mean, we can get there without knowing the brain. Actually, that's exactly what Richard Stern told me. And he thinks we can get there without knowing the brain, but if we do know how the brain works, that's a shortcut. Mm. Right. Well, I, I, would agree, I would agree with that. The question is how big a shortcut is it? So I, I felt it was a 50 year shortcut, and I think other people think it's like a few year shortcut. Yeah. And so, you know, it remains to be seen. Uh, I feel, yeah, I feel a lot of people optimistic. We had this, one day we came up with this uh, idea of a Turing test. I mean, think we tweeted about it that a good Turing test is if an AI can write uh, a paper and submit to NeurIPS and get the paper approved. So you're essentially fooling a bunch of AI experts into thinking <laughs> you are an AI expert. <laughs> <laughs> but like the ultimate Turing test. And I asked Richie when, when does he think this is going to happen? And he's, I asked specifically, do you think we we'll get this by 2040? And he said, no, I think way before 2040. <laughs> See, I don't think so, that's a good Turing test at all. Well, I, I don't think it's a good Turing test, but I think you could do that probably next year. Wow. Like so it is, a, it is, quote, a Turing test, but sort I think that the whole idea <laughs> of a Turing test is faulty. Because, again, it's, it's solving one problem. And yeah, you know, if you put all your resources towards doing that, you should be able to do it. You're going to come up with a lot of specific hacks along the way to make it work. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it, it, and it gets back to the perennial problem. Well, a machine solves this one problem. Is it really intelligent? Is it generally intelligent? And that b debate about it, um, anyway. But they were really proposing this as a, as a, as a proper test, though, right? No, we, we were. This, this, this was post beer. It yeah. like, post beer. Uh, yeah. It's a post <laughs> beer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a real thing. So uh, maybe given the timing, maybe yeah, I can suggest that it happens even longer. Okay. More than that, that's um, almost the last line on the deep learning. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you got Joshua Banger talking. What is next in deep learning? That was a really good talk. His slides are online. I think I sent many. Uh, so he said the long term goal is to learn representations that disentangle causal features. Uh, he talked a lot about imagining the abstract space that goes back to that consciousness uh, prior. Can I, I'm sorry to keep dragging this out here, but uh -huh. it's interesting. I, I wanted to read that sentence is, what does he think is next in sort of artificial intelligence? But it's not. It, it, what is next in deep learning, which is a, a very, very, very more narrow point of view. Was that clear that he was making that more uh, narrow distinction? I'm not sure if that's the name of the talk. Maybe I got it wrong. I think, I think it's what is next in machine learning, maybe. Or AI. I, I think I've made up the, the yeah. No. I mean, it's and next could be like what we're going to do in two months from now, or next could be like what we have to do over the, the following 10 years. So it was what we have to do over the following 10 years. That right, so then that, this seems really kind of like. But I, I think thinking. the name of the talk is what is next in AI, maybe. The, that, the, that feels then these are very small thinking ideas here, you know, d disentangle causal features. Well, of course you have to do that, but is that what AI is about? You know, what about sensory motor learning and sensory motor integration and, you know, what? Well, some pretty big stuff here, like system one versus system two, it looks like it's going to be big. Yeah, I, I, I just think it doesn't feel like a list for AI this, or AGI, this feels more like a... I think a few things that I, what I felt like really interesting is uh, this, for example, this thing about imagining abstract space and one of the ideas that language can be that actually abstract yeah. space. And so they are working on this grounded language understanding problems. It's similar to that clever one, like put, next, put the blue key next to the green ball. That's like a very simple one. <laughs> but you have like huge ones, like huge mazes. And it's called like baby AI. So it's things that human can do, like kids can do, but machine learning can't do. So they're working on this kind of problem. <laughs> Block, and he has, his, <laughs> he has this idea of system one versus system two, which goes back to the consciousness prior thing, that you have abstract concepts and you can do counterfactual reasoning and generalization on top of abstract concepts, but that's, um, and then when you need, you, you, you have to ground them by the system one, like that's the, 
the, the fast inference uh, classifying image, etc. So you need to have two systems talk uh, to one another. Uh, talk about doing self-supervised learning latent space rather than data space that uh, we don't reason in pixels, we don't do anything in pixels. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense that we're doing like self-supervised learning on top of pixels. And uh, I think uh, CPC does a little bit of that. Uh, so the consciousness prior, I think we, we talk about that. Uh, discovering good disentangled representations. It's uh, one big deal that goes straight toward the continual learning problem. Uh, right now, our representations are all thing up, and if you change one thing, you just mess up your whole network. He talked about the work being done by Berkeley of uns unsupervised agents and intrinsic rewards that the agents define themselves what is the goal, what is the reward, and they can learn by playing. So when you assign them a downstream task, they already know some stuff. So the agent can, for example, see a ball and decide, oh, I'm just going to interact with the ball. And then you can learn things like throwing the ball, grabbing the ball. And when you give a downstream task, like, OK, put the ball in the table, it already learn like, a lot of things just by playing. And that's an analogy how uh, humans learn. Uh, talk about going beyond IID. Like, a lot of people talk about going beyond IID. And I think the main, the main thing I got from his talk is he's really, he really wants we, the researchers to bring GoFi like good old fashioned AI, like symbolic called the reasoning, back into AI. What? But not, but on top of uh, latent representation. So the whole idea is that you have these two systems. So you're still doing deep learning and you. So you're doing those things using, you're using, you're capturing some of the properties of GoFi using neural networks. Is yeah, that that, 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 that's the idea. So it's not exactly bringing GoFi back, but bringing this idea of you can do counterfactual reasoning back into the picture. But now you're doing counterfactual reason not on top of, you know, like uh, specific words or concepts you define, but on top of like latent representations, which carry semantic meaning. And yeah. That's like the gist of it. And that's what one very popular slide a lot of people applauded. And that goes back to your question. So he had this slide applications I don't want to work on. This was a popular slide. Uh, this uh this small Oh the group. small one was yeah. a popular slide. Like applications I don't want to work on. And he I saw it on Twitter. I you saw, saw it on Twitter? Twitter? Oh, okay, so that was. <laughs> <laughs> so he did, doesn't want to work on military application, like stock market, advertising. And he was really making the point that people should not be working on that. That it rules out Google, it rules out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what's the first, I'm sorry, the first half of that slide, how does it fit with my values? This is something he doesn't want to work on, too, or is just the second half of the slide? Yeah, the I second half of things it doesn't work on too, and the first one is like, you, these are the questions you have to ask when you work on a problem. How does it fit my values? How is the technology going to be used? Who will benefit or who will suffer from it? And how much you Those are things you should be thinking about. You should be asking I about say, um, and then the second half is things I don't want to do. Yeah. He said like, I don't want to do, but he implied like, no one should do. That was like the implication <laughs> behind the, 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 the whole lecture. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was actually the last slide. So th this presentation is on the Google Drive. I think it's, uh, it's actually into the Yosha Banjo. Uh, Black Richards, it's not. And the other ones are more uh, general. If someone wants like a good introduction to neural networks, I really like Hugo Lahush's uh, presentation. He had like this online course. I like the notation, yeah, the way he puts things. Have you have seen his videos earlier? His videos earlier. Yeah. So. Yeah. He does that every summer school for the last five years. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. So he's like always starting off giving this talk. Yeah, he, this was the first uh, lecture of the summer school. Yeah, but he's done it every year. So. Uh, he, he's done every year. Yeah, so it's, like, he leaves off every year. And yeah. That's he's a, got it polished by now. Yeah, he's really <laughs> polished, yeah. That, he's a, like, this is a younger version of him. He's like a lot older now than this picture. <laughs> <laughs> this is like years ago. All right, so. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, yeah then I'll leave reinforcement learning another day. Yeah, let's, let's schedule that. That's okay. good. And uh, I can, this is uh, the the city in a very uh, Photoshop picture. <laughs> 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 it doesn't look like this. Is this a real picture? It's a game. Yeah. <laughs> look like a game, right? Yeah. Did you take this picture and then, and then? No, I, the no, I found it on the. Oh. It's definitely stylized. Well, yeah, you could run it through one of those filters they have built. Yeah, you did. 
Oh yeah, if you're drunk enough, it looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> With experience. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If Thanks. you want to stop sharing your oh, yeah. screen. Okay. How do I do that? You need that. So, um, should, we, should we stop the stream at this point? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. I don't I know. Yeah, I think I am. I think I'm gonna stop the stream. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll we'll continue this with the reinforcement learning portion soon.